Welcome to the regular, regular meeting of the City Planning Commission. Today is Tuesday, November, November 1st. My name is Alyssa Olson and I'm the president of the Planning Commission. The city will be recording and posting this meeting to the city's website and YouTube channel as a means of increasing public access and transparency. This meeting is public and subject to the Minnesota Open Meeting Law. At this time, I will ask the clerk to please call the roll. Commissioner Alper. Present. Commissioner Baxley. Here. Commissioner Campbell. Here. Commissioner Cerillo. <coughs> is absent. Commissioner Feola. Here. Commissioner Ford. Here. Commissioner Marwa. Here. Commissioner McGuire. Here. Commissioner Olson. Here. Commissioner Rainville. Present. We have nine members present. All right, we have a quorum. So next we'll proceed to the agenda, a copy of which was posted for public access to the city's legislative information management system, which is available at limbs.minneapolismn.gov. You can also find it on the counter over by the clerk. Um, we'll been, begin with acceptance of the minutes from October 17th. Could I have a motion to accept those minutes? All right, we have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Any abstentions? All right, that motion passes and the minutes have been adopted. Our next order of business is to organize the public hearing agenda for today. I'll read through the agenda uh, numbers and addresses and state whether they're slated for consent or discussion. Uh, consent items will be passed by the board uh, adopting staff recommendation as well as any stated conditions. Uh, so if you agree with staff recommendation, you don't need to do anything and the board will pass the item uh, as recommended. If you disagree with staff recommendation on an item, uh, you can raise your hand, uh, let us know, and we can put that item on the discussion agenda. So with that, the following items are on the agenda this evening. Item number four is 2521 24th Avenue South. Staff is recommending this item for consent. Is there anyone here to speak against staff recommendation on item number four? Seeing none, I'll put item number four on consent. Item number five is 921 and 927 Marshall Street Northeast. Staff is recommending this item for consent. Is there anyone here to speak against staff recommendation on item number five? All right, we'll put item number five on discuss discussion. Item number six is 925 4th Street Southeast. Staff is recommending this item for consent. Is there anyone here who would like to speak against staff recommendation on item number six? Okay. Item number six will be on our discussion. Item number seven is 1913 Third Avenue South. Staff is recommending this item for consent. Is there anyone here who would like to speak against staff recommendation on item number seven? All right, seeing none, we'll put item number seven on consent. Item number, oh, okay. <laughs> item number eight is 219 Fourth Street South. Staff is recommending this item for consent. Is there anyone here who would like to speak against staff recommendation on item number eight? Seeing none, we'll put item eight on consent. And item number nine uh, is recommended for consent. The public hearing for this item was closed at our September 22nd meeting, so this will not be a public hearing item. All right, so. To review, we have items number four, seven, and eight on consent. Item numbers, items number five and six will be discussed, and item number nine um, is unfinished business um, that we will pass as consent. Uh, could I have a motion to approve the agenda as amended? So moved. Yeah. All right, we have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? All right, seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Any abstentions? All right, that motion passes and the agenda has been approved. 
Uh, up next, we're going to proceed to our public hearing agenda. Um, so I'm going to open the public hearing. Sorry, excuse me, our consent public hearing. Um, I'm going to open the public hearing for items four, seven, and eight. Uh, is there anyone here who would like to speak to items four, seven, or eight? If so, you can come to the podium, state your name and address for the record, and proceed with your comments. All right, not seeing any, I will close the public hearing for the consent agenda. Do I have a motion to adopt items four, seven, and eight uh, on consent? Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, uh, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Any abstentions? All right, that motion passes. So if you were here for items four, seven, or eight, those applications have been approved. Uh, good luck with your projects. Up next is item number nine. This is an uh, unfinished business item, um, and there's no public hearing. Uh, is there any discussion, or would someone like to make a motion? Uh, are we having, oh, okay. <laughs> Would someone like to make a motion uh, to uh, adopt item number nine uh, with staff recommendation? So moved. Second. Right. Is there any discussion? Yeah, I have a question, Madam Chair. Uh, has, on. has anything changed since what we had it last time? I believe, uh, yes, most people have that question. Um, Hillary, would you be willing to give a short um, overview of what has changed. Yes, you guys are throwing me for a loop tonight. Sorry. <laughs> up, down, up, down. <laughs> Didn't know what we were doing. <laughs> okay. Uh, good evening or good afternoon, commissioners. I'm Hillary Dvorak. I'm a planner in CPED. This is um, item number nine on your agenda this evening. This is the Trolley Line Condos Project at 4352 Zenith Avenue South. This item was first before you on September 19th. Um, I was not here. Um, I was home watching the meeting. Uh, Kimberly Helene, my manager, presented. Uh, you discussed, took public testimony, and then closed the public hearing. Since that meeting, the development team has met with the neighborhood to discuss the project in more details. So, uh, since that meeting with the neighbors, there have been changes made to the building, and I highlighted these in the staff report. The placement of the building has changed or shifted. The building is now located the 32.4 feet back from the front property line, and those two front patios, or ducks, excuse me, I will not change my terminology, the ducks have been reduced in size to 50 square feet. So the building itself and the ducks no longer need variances. By reducing the size of those patios, they also reduced, or excuse me, eliminated the need for the south interior side yard setback for that deck. So those two variances went away. There is still a variance for the awning that is over the front yard patio. Um, the building shifted one foot from the north interior property line. So this setback from the north had been seven and is now eight feet, and the building has shifted from the west or the rear property line. So this portion of the building is now 11 feet, and then this portion in the middle is nine. Those had been seven and nine, and now they're nine and 11, so everything shifted over two feet. The air conditioning units were shifted from the rear yard down to the south side of the building. The materials and colors and the arrangement of the materials and the colors of those materials on the building have changed to make the light, the back of the building lighter, excuse me, as um, from the, from, for the neighbors. And a living wall feature was added to the rear wall. <clears throat> so those are the changes that were made. Um, you know, the first application that needs to be dealt with tonight is the rezoning that is from the R2B to the R3. We do believe that that is consistent with the comprehensive plan. The guidance is urban neighborhood and then corridor three in this development fits within the guidelines for those future land use categories. This is a different view of the site plan. The original was the, or the first one that I showed you was their landscape plan. This is their civil site plan. This is to show the uh, 
the variance that is still needed for these awnings, the integrated awnings into the building. Um, they project five feet permitted obstructions for awnings are two and a half. The building has shifted. We are recommending approval of that variance. Um, it is akin to porches that you see on houses that are allowed to project into those required front yards. So we are recommending approval of that. And the last application then that's before you is the site plan review. Um, they do meet all of the site plan review standards, except for there is a blank wall on that north elevation is 61 feet. Blank wall should not exceed 25. They are mitigating that by including landscaping along that north wall. I just wanted to show you these are some re, um, updated images that show the uh, revised uh, materials and color palette of the building. In the lower right, you can see the living wall feature that was added to the building and shows a different view of that building. And then I wanted to just point out that this is that blank wall on that north elevation on that lower, on the um, basement level that needed the alternative compliance. So those, that was the presentation that I put together, it highlights the changes and I will stand for any questions. Thank you, Hillary. Uh, any other questions, Commissioner Rainville? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So I have one question, but I'd like two separate people to answer it. We postponed this in order for the developer and the uh, community to speak further so they could come to uh, more of an agreement. Is the developer here? C could you please step forward and tell me how your conversations with the community went? Uh, yes, we had a meeting at the Linden Hills, uh, well, in conjunction with the Linden Hills Neighborhood Association. Uh, we had it at Linden Hills Park, and about, and I guess about 35 people showed up from the neighborhood, and we held a, a Zoom call as well with anybody that could not attend, and I think we talked for about and answered questions for approximately two to three hours, um, showed them all the changes that we were uh, proposing to make. Some were happy with the changes some were not um, but overall i think we did the very best we could to address the most the the largest concerns they had um, the one that we just are not able to change that we felt like was going to be the most difficult change was moving the location of the elevator and the rear staircase um, it just would have required a completely different building uh, designed to actually move that location and still be able to have the parking and the and the uh, the unit makeup that we have there currently. But and then we communicated again with the neighbors via email once we submitted the revisions to the city. Uh, that same day we or the next day I apologize. The next day we sent a long email outlining all the details of those changes to the neighbors and. I haven't heard anything back from any of those neighbors other than the neighbor to the north. They've asked for some additional communication, but that's not necessarily relevant to tonight. It's more about how the driveway is going to work in the future what, that we used to share with them. So, Thank you. Yep. Is there someone from the community who would, who would like to uh, t uh, tell us so the view of it? The public hearing would have to be reopened. To, to hear from the neighbors. Okay, I'm gonna make a motion to reopen the public hearing. Okay, is there... Uh, I'd be happy to just make one... No, hold on. So, um, so if there's already a motion on the table, we can still... So I believe the question is, there's a motion on the table to approve the project that has not been voted on. Right. And now we have a subsequent motion to reopen the public hearing. I will defer to the clerk on the proper procedure. Um, my, my general advice would be that since the motion has already been made to approve the project, a motion to reopen a public hearing would not be in order. Um, and in order to hold a public hearing, we would need to notice a public hearing, which we have not done for this evening. Okay. Um, all right. Let's see. Commissioner Rainville, did you have anything else before uh, we? I would uh, just, I have a question for the staff. And so this meets all the legal requirements, correct? There is no uh, violations. With the uh, approval of the three land use applications, the project will be in conformance with their zoning code and comprehensive plan. 
Okay. And then one last comment. Uh, moving forward, it seems like projects like this, that there's not an alley separating the two uh, properties, that this becomes a real issue, the, the uh, setbacks. So uh, can I just suggest that the staff take a harder look at that as, as we go forward, please? Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. Um, Commissioner Alper, did you have a comment? Yes, I just had a quick thing. Um, I've been in touch with Park Board staff, and they submitted a letter on um, uh, to the city commenting on this this uh, development because it uh, it's immediately adjacent to the Linden Hills trolley path, which is part of MPRB's adopted Southwest Service Area Master Plan. So, but I do want to say uh, their comment, the comment from staff, which I would like to communicate as the Park Board representative, um, just had to do with that uh, previous variance of the um, south interior side yard setback from seven feet to three feet. Um, and with that, MPRB did not have any serious concerns about the development, and so certainly now that the variance has gone away, um, the Park Board, I just want it to be on record, that has uh, no concerns about this um, project. Thanks. All right. Um, any other questions? Otherwise, I'm not seeing any. Um, we do have a motion on the table to adopt staff recommendation. Uh, is there any discussion before we call the roll? Uh, Commissioner Rainville. I, I just want to direct my comments to the community. I, I understand how you feel, but uh, as you heard, th this there is no violation of law here, so I'm, I'm going to be voting yes for this. But I, I, I feel you, and I hear you loud and clear. I'm sorry. Any other discussion? Uh, Marwa, sorry, Commissioner Marwa. <laughs> Good to see you. <laughs> um, I just, just want to commend to the to the developer. I thank you, Hillary, for highlighting those changes. I think that was a really helpful um, example of when we continue this, uh, kind of the beneficial changes that can be made. I think that living wall is a great addition. Um, I think there's some really cool um, dynamics that you guys are bringing to this project and to your own neighborhood. So I thank you for that. But I also want to just make the uh, make it state on the record that I think continuing this was a great idea um, and for you all. So thank you for taking the time to meet with the community also and making these changes. Any other discussion? All right, seeing none, I will ask the clerk to please call the roll. Councilmember Alper. Aye. Councilmember Baxley. Aye. Excuse me, commissioners. <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner Campbell. Aye. Commissioner Cerillo is absent. Commissioner Feola. Aye. Com Commissioner Ford. Aye. Commissioner Marwa. Aye. Commissioner McGuire. Aye. Commissioner Rainville. Aye. Chair Olson. Aye. That's nine yeas and zero nays. All right, that motion passes and that item has been approved. Our next uh, agenda item uh, we'll move on to our discussion items uh, and it is item number five 921 and 927 Marshall Street Northeast and staff is Shanna Souther Good afternoon, commissioners, President Olson. My name is Shanna Sutter. I'm a planner with CPED, and I'll be presenting item number five, which is uh, for the properties located at 921 and 927 Marshall Street Northeast. The Cedric property is located at the corner of 10th Avenue Northeast and Marshall Street Northeast. There are two existing low-density uh, residential structures. Both are single-family dwellings. The applicant is proposing to demolish the two structures in order to allow for the future construction of a multiple family dwelling, five stories in height, uh, with 89 dwelling units. 
The proposed project requires two applications. The first is site plan review to allow for the new construction of the multiple family dwelling. And the second is an administrative height increase to increase the maximum height in the corridor four district from four stories, 56 feet to five stories, 62 feet. The subject property is zoned R5 multiple family district and B4C, or sorry, BFC4 corridor four multiple family district. Um, so the use is permitted. Um, let's see. So staff has received a number of public comments. Those have been included both in the staff report uh, that we received last week as well as uh, your addendum packet today. Um, as far as site plan review, the applicant is seeking alternative compliance um, for two, um, two requirements. First is the windows facing 10th Avenue Northeast, um, where there are walkout units and um, a, a parking garage that is all glass. You can see that here, kind of in the lower left of the drawing. Staff is recommending uh, granting of the alternative compliance. And then second is on that same facade is the active functions. Um, again, it's the parking garage location that is what is driving the need for that um, alternative compliance. And staff is recommending approval for that. For the administrative height increase, the applicant is proposing to provide affordable dwelling units on site consistent with the inclusionary zoning policy. Um, and so for that, they're allowed to go up to an additional story and 14 feet. Um, here's a drawing that does a nice job of kind of um, articulating the proposed structure. So the portion here kind of in white is what you see is the five story portion of the structure. Four stories here, four stories here, and then one story there. We're adjacent to um, the single family, single family dwelling to the east. Staff analyzed the proposed height increase with findings on pages seven and eight of the staff report today. Staff finds that the, the project does a nice job of resp responding to the pedestrian character at the first floor. Um, there are walk-up units as well as um, uh, an open space and some uh, seating areas and landscaped, generous landscaping along the periphery. Um, Staff also found that the portion of the building receiving height, the height increase responds well to the adjacent um, lower um, built form district. So across the public alley for the properties here that are off of Main Street, those properties um, are zoned B4I2, which is the interior two built form uh, district. And so uh, just kind of again, noting the stepping down of the building and the separation between the, um, the height that's the increase has sought. So there is a public alley there. And then um, we measured approximately 72 feet between where the fifth floor is and the adjacent dwelling to the east. Staff found that the building form and massing was distributed in a way that was um, consistent with the appropriate scale and proportion for the structure and the surrounding area as well. And then lastly, uh, that the exterior materials are compatible on all four sides of the structure. So here are the um, bird's eye view of the axon. So you can um, also have kind of an appreciation. So although this property here along Marshall Street to the South is also designated as corridor four. You can see the applicant does a nice job of recessing the upper portion of the fifth floor um, to reduce the massing where adjacent to the lower density residential. Um, there's also a 16 foot setback from the fourth, the floors one through four on that side as well. So staff is recommending approval of the requested applications with fine or with findings, and then uh, conditions listed on pages 12 and 13 of the staff report. With that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Shanna. Uh, commissioners, any questions for staff before we move on? I'm not seeing any. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I will now open the public hearing. Is the applicant here to speak on this item? Commissioner Dean DeVolis, DJ Architecture, good afternoon. I'll be brief. Uh, we really tried to 
erode the mass of the building and shape it to really scale with the neighborhood since it's a neighborhood in transition from historically single family to multifamily. So he wanted this building to really be his best a good neighbor. And that's how I worked very hard in, the, in terms of the uh, street plane, the units have individual entries, and then carving away the mass of the building. So, and then that's sort of why the shape it is. So it appears as smaller increments, not just one big L. So we worked hard at that. And actually in the neighborhood meeting, we had surprised some people speak in favor of design. They never gave a recommendation going forward, but uh, we had some neighbors are very appreciative of the efforts we took to shape this building. So we're here if we have any questions. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, commissioners, any questions for the applicant? Commissioner Rainville? Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm curious, how many affordable units are going to be in there with the inclusionary? We have seven, seven, seven total. Okay. And then I, I have a, um, a kind of a philosophical question. So down, down farther down Marshall is uh, another uh, apartment building that's being developed, 184 units, but they have one for one parking, 184 parking. I'm just wondering why you're parking. What's your the philosophy with uh, less parking? Each developer obviously picks its own roadmap, uh, and. I have projects we've worked on are all over the map. Some developers are pushing us a 1.5, even two. Some are saying buildings work with a 0.5 ratio, some zero. The philosophy of this is to provide some parking, but not make it overly parking dependent. And part of it's a give and take, because I could literally, let's say, make the whole first floor garage, but then I'm sacrificing the streetscape. So it's a balancing design parking availability, and so what we sort of struck was a middle ground, providing some parking uh, to meet the man, but also look at the idea that, you know, it's that the city is evolving, it's, it has a high transfer to bus lanes, and preserve the streetscape, because if I truly went one for one, and this was a small lot, so I couldn't really make an underground garage work, I'd really be sacrificing the streetscape. So that's how we arrived at the balance with Great. this project. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, Commissioner uh, Alper. Thank you. So I notice you are, it looks like you're gonna have to cut down a couple mature trees. Is that true? I just looked at Google Maps. If, if they're between the houses, there's no way to avoid that, yeah. unfortunately. Yep, absolutely, we I understand. Tried, we tried to wiggle the building around as much as we could to scale that, but there's certain trees that yep. just are dead center yep. in the building and I just, couldn't weave around them and make it work. And then if you cut too much of the root ball off, you kill the tree to begin with. Right, right. So I think my question really stems yeah. from, um, you know, just taking a quick, I'm curious if you, uh, your building will have water spigots on 10th and Marshall, just because I, you know, the that makes the boulevard trees even more important. And I... Hold just want to make sure that you're, you've got plans in place um, that will allow you to water the trees because we're in a severe drought here. That's huge. And, you know, working in other neighborhoods, I've seen a lot of high mortality of city trees. So you're absolutely right and tremendous. So we will provide the spigots and the irrigation to preserve, especially tree, especially with the fact that uh, the next uh, tree death is uh, washing through with... Uh, and you know, I read the article in the Star Tribune, what's occurring that's moving from east to west through the metro, and we're all next up. So yes, absolutely, yeah. we'll provide Great. It. Go ahead, uh, Carl, uh, introduce yourself. Uh, Carl Ronk, the development project with uh, Mark Ewis Gates here, that um, the, the mature ash trees that are on the public right away in the site are already tagged for Ashbourne, unfortunately, right. so we will be replanting as part of the project. Thanks for that. Um, and I just wanted to tag team off the, the parking comment from um, Commissioner Rainville here. I'm just curious what how you are planning to meet the um, minor TDM plan and what strategies you're using. Curious if, if transit is one of them. So when you build a TDM, you really work on a whole variety of areas because you know transit's a multi more from pedestrian to bikes. To the public transit, to smart cars, and those elements. 
So, well, we've been successful past the sort of addressing all those aspects uh, with the building management, with discounted transit, transit passes, with bike rooms that are lighted, accessible on the main floor, with providing pedestrian maps, with integrating with the neighborhood and making sure the neighborhood is welcome to the building, and community means there, which helps foster pedestrian uh, communication and walking and, th and things like that. And I'll see the limiting the car space. So it's sort of an all program. It's not just the cars, uh, you know, it used to be as, but today you have to sort of cover all bases of it. So it's actually going to be a package across all elements to help with the TDM plan. Amanda? Yeah, if you all, do, would you like me to, I'm Amanda Pedersen, DJR. Would you like me to specifically address how we are going to meet the points or? Just, just a few seconds on it. <laughs> sure. Okay, okay. So for, for the size of our project required four points for the minor TDMP and one of them, which will be provided through um, having the, the parking be leased uh, at a separate from the monthly rent. And the other right. is that the um, has to do with the, that we're providing actually less than 0.5. Uh, the, it, we're at a ratio of 0.36. So that gives us the three points, which is f to the four that we would be required for the minor TDMP. Less than five minutes. There you go. <laughs> or five uh, seconds. Commissioner Alpert, were you good? Okay, Commissioner Marwa. Uh, yes, hi. I had a question just why was the decision made to not kind of include any neighborhood serving retail space? This seems like a big corridor where you could have put, you know, a 500 square foot pop up, you know, ca cafe space or something. Like it just, you're going to be right across from Graco Park. You have a ton of foot traffic. I walk this very often. Um, why is that kind of the decision there? Oh, yeah, please, please. Thank you. Thank you so much, Commissioner Alper. The property is zoned R5 multiple family district, and the future land use designation is urban neighborhood. So commercial is not an allowed use on the, on the subject property. In order to allow for a commercial use, you would have to have a much larger lot and do a plan unit development instead. So when the city took a look at the comprehensive plan and the future land use, this was not a property, or these properties were not slated for commercial or retail. So the developer couldn't even put in a corner spot if they wanted to, even though this is going to be like a super high-trafficked corridor? The, the future land use designation here is urban neighborhood. We have a goods and services corridor to the north, Broadway Street Northeast, and then also to the east along University Avenue Northeast. The reason why those corridors are so critical and those have the designations is to make sure that we're concentrating retail where um, it's generally in a line. When we start to kind of move further away from the corridors, we're looking at more of like multiple family dwellings in order to support the retail on those goods and service corridors. Okay. I don't fully agree with that, but I will take your response. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, I'll just add one thing. Knowing that, uh, if you can see here, that's how we added the units with the individual entry and the front porches wrapping around the building. Since we couldn't create a retail life, we said, well, let's at least have individual entries, units having a direct access to the public streets to at least give that idea of individual identity and street activity. So that was the compromise we were able to work with since uh, zoning didn't allow us to do active retail. Commissioner Rainville, did you have another question? I'm sorry. Oh, okay. All right. I'm not seeing any other questions, so thank you. Thank you. Um, we will continue with the public hearing. Is there anyone else who would like to speak about this item? If so, please come forward to the podium, state your name and address for the record, and proceed with your comments. Hello. Good evening. I'm, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm Stefan Boda. I live... At, all right, I own the duplex <coughs> across the alley, uh, 110 or 114 uh, 10th Avenue Northeast. Um, and uh, thank you, Commissioner Ranville, for addressing the, the parking. Um, when I first bought the property uh, about a year and a half ago, uh, I pulled up and realized there's no place to park, all right? And, um, so frequently I have to drop off my supplies to, you know, maintenance the building, you know, drive down the alley and go park on 9th, sometimes another block and a half away. Um, and that's kind of customary. I don't really have a lot of off-street parking for my residence. I have uh, four renters in the duplex total and three of them have cars. Um, so I have two very small off-street 
um, spaces. Um, so it's, it's not an ideal parking situation for me, obviously, and, um, the, uh, and what isn't also being addressed here is that there is another property directly across 10th Avenue, which is also being built currently. I believe it's 49 units, and they have 12 parking spaces, right? So if you line up you know, all the cars from that building and all the cars from this proposed building, you've got multiple, multiple blocks of parking. Um, uh, even, uh, it's, just, it's just impossible to fit into the space. It's just, I know, I know you guys don't like to take parking into consideration, but the reality on the ground is it's gonna be a nightmare, so. Um, and, um, you know, my wife and I are very concerned about it because this is our, this is our only investment we have, a property, and, um, you know, our renters are already having doubts about staying there. It's, um, you know, we can't raise the rents. Um, it's been a complete, you know, uh, disruption for about a year now with the other property. It's gonna keep going on now. Um, so you might have seen, when they put the first picture up of the 3D uh, picture, which looked very nice, um, my little duplex was that little birdhouse looking thing down in the left corner. So it's gonna be absolutely dwarfed by this. Um, and uh, it just seems like, um, you know, we're talking about the streetscape being really nice on the Marshall side. Well, on the my side, I've got a transformer and I've got a generator. I'm looking directly across the alley from, from my um, property. So not exactly the most um, uh, greatest view from, from my place. Um, I'm not someone who's anti-development by any means, but um, it just seems like this, there just needs to be a better solution for the parking and maybe a little more setback. I'd love to see the transformer out of my backyard. <laughs> Um, and moved over a little bit. Um, I kind of figured that somebody would come and snatch up that lot and buy it. Um, and, um, but it would just be nice if there was a little bit more sensitivity to the reality of the local residents and the future residents, to be quite honest, because they, there's not going to be any place for anyone to park. I mean, period. I mean, it's going to be a disaster. Even when that other building across the street from us is done, it's, it's it's not going to work. If there's a, if there's a snow emergency, if the 1029 club has their bingo tent up, just forget about it. There's there's nothing. There's no parking for blocks anywhere. You know, and if you're looking at quality of life, increase the parking for for all these people because it's just um, uh, you know. Can you imagine carrying your groceries home or you know taking your kid home? You know, three blocks when it's 20 below zero. You know, it's and the so-called evolution to a commuter, you know, community and bikes and stuff, that's all great, but it's just not real. Um, and um, someone just has to acknowledge, I think that that's, um, it's, it's not what we're all experiencing out there. So, um, yeah, I guess that's my main concern. Um, and, um, yeah, I don't know how these comments are incorporated. I've never done this before. <laughs> um, and, uh, but I don't know if there's any room uh, to work on a few of those points. That would be great. So anyway. No Thank you for your comments. All right, thanks. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Rainville. Uh, thank you, Stefan. So I have a question of the developers. Uh, is there any way you can rework that transformer? I understand the generator is for emergencies, so that won't be activated unless there's a power blackout, but uh, is that a possibility to redo that transformer? Yeah, transformer and generators are always really tricky on urban infill sites, um, and typically, you know, the city has requirements as far as where they're allowed to be placed, and that's uh, pretty limited because you have to, um, not put it too close to a building that could be set on fire. You can't put it too close. So, you know, the interior side yard wouldn't be an ideal condition for that either. 
Um, it also has to be able to be accessed and serviced by Excel. Excel has their own requirements. Um, and so we are providing screening from the transformer and generator um, with some plantings. And um, so that, you know, that was the, the best location as far as, you know, efficient, you know, just making it work for the, for the project. Um, we could certainly, you know, talk to Shanna and see if there's any other options, but I, it, it was kind of the place to put it. The alley you know, has to be off the alley, non-negotiable. Now, if we can like, you know, there's a, you see your existing door, there's a house here, so we pushed it here to keep it away from this house. So that was a conscious decision why we put it where it was, where there's a more open space. It really landscaped these backyards and we landscaped around it. So we sort of took the best position within the requirements of where this could be situated, because if we went further to the north, it would be right across this dwelling. Down here, it's across from a backyard, so it's not directly off someone's side. As soon as off the rear yard, and there's sufficient rear yard to lessen impact. So that's how we evolved at this location. Side yards are not negotiable. Front yard can't happen, so that's why it's located. We did landscaping and so forth. So, thank you. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Marwa. Did you have a comment? Uh, yes, I had a question. Have you guys thought, uh, you know, about working with Graco or the the neighboring parking lots about kind of a shared use agreement if there's additional parking needed by your tenants? So, you know, something if there's a monthly fee that they can pay and use some of that? Because I definitely understand that there is def there's not a ton of street parking around that area, too. You're hitting on to, which is more of a topic that's evolving. I call it community parking or common parking mm -hmm. or a shared parking plan amongst other developers or feasible. So if one's light, yeah. we take over and vice versa. That's part of the program. As we tend it up, that'll be part of the basis. And you know, we hope in the future that the city starts evolving to what I call community parking ramps or structures that start picking up some of that burn. But that is part of the program of, of one's good situated to see how we could share parking and locate people within other people's property were available. Well, so and, and across is, yes. the street, you have parking lot that's used during the day, Correct. but not probably in the evenings. And it's great, you know, very close to you. Yep. Have you guys talked to each other about sharing? And that's a possibility parking? that some people, just to give you a warning, some people are very jealous of their parking lots because it comes with liability and other issues. But the answer is, as our tenants come in, we will work with them to find alternatives, including across the street. And elsewhere, but it's a little bit case by case basis, and that's where it gets a little tricky because some people welcome it; it's income. Some people look at it. I want the liability, but yes, we want to make sure because you want to make sure it works for everyone. And the idea is to use the existing part of infrastructure more intensely and off hours and things like that. So yeah, that's part of the program of working through this. And that answer mean yes, you have talked to them, or no, you have no. <laughs> no, the, the, the answer is, our, as an applicant, we have not spoken directly because to Graco. Because we're not approved we, yet, we, so we got to make sure. We are, we are willing to reach out to Graco. Our experience from the Neighborhood Association is they've not been willing to work with other projects. Correct. On sharing parking is our knowledge at this point, but we're willing to work with Graco or reach out. Okay. Well, I encourage you. I think it's not just them. There's a number of neighboring parking, surface parking areas. I mean, for a fee and talk about, you know, you, all of those ideas, but I think being better neighbors and partnering and sharing that existing surface parking. I would love to see that happen. No, agreed. Thank you. We just wanted to wait after so we were definitive about it. Yes, we're going ahead. This is what's happening. Were you willing to negotiate? Because sometimes these property owners get cried wolf so much, then they just brush you off. So we're just a little more conservative on the approach. So the answer is we will, but have not yet to make sure we're through this process first. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Rainville. Uh, great idea for the, what did you call it, community parking? Yeah. Yes. And I, I'll, I'll volunteer to uh, uh, contact Rayco and see if I can mediate and, and help you because I, I do think that's the solution. There are, there are huge parking areas that Graco has. And uh, the uh, Stefan, you're right, uh, it, it's only going to get worse. So I'll, I'll uh, volunteer to step up and see if I can help facilitate this conversation we would love Maybe to have we can your talk influence afterwards. yeah we would love that yeah. thank you that's all right um i'm not seeing any more questions is there anyone else who hasn't spoken already oh 
Go ahead, Commissioner Ford. I want to go back to the issue of the transformer and the gentleman's concern for it. You said that um, there will be screening and some landscaping. Right. What exactly does that mean? Is it going to be, I mean, what, what, what height will it be? And Now, Amanda, we're not allowed to fence it, correct, by the rules? Or can we put a fence and screening? Because there is these transfers come with rules that are pretty strict and are non-negotiable. So I just want to, perhaps we are doing the landscaping screening, but I just want to make sure that I don't promise what can't be delivered. So right now what's proposed is um, some uh, evergreen U uh, screening, which are, vertical. which are vertical. And I, I, I'm not the landscape architect, uh, but um, you know I believe those can become three, four feet tall and would screen. The intent is that they would grow tall enough to screen screen the element. Um, you can provide a fence with the you, gate. How, how tall is the it meets all the. It looks like it meets all the requirements, though, under the site plan review. Yeah. So we cannot discuss this as part of our item tonight. I can well, hold on, right? Madam Chair, <laughs> I can ask the, the question. Yeah. Okay, you can ask the question. That's hey, correct. And uh, but Commissioner McGuire is right. You know, the site plan review um, requirements appear to be met. So, um, Kimberly. So I believe I, the staff review concluded that the height of the proposed landscaping would adequately screen the transformer based on the height of the proposed transformer as well. So Shanna is nodding. She did uh, affirm okay. that with her review. <laughs> Our you. preference is a natural landscaping as opposed to a fence. Okay, so that's great. what we chose. So is this going to be the, 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 the correct height on day one or 15 years from now? It would be at maturity of the proposed landscaping, which is how all of our landscaping and screening requirements read. Um, I will also note staff spends a lot of time with applicants and Excel Energy at times even designing projects around transformer locations because it is so tricky to find an appropriate place for a transformer. Um, the city council can tell you we've had a few things before them this year on appeal because we have had transformers moved after the fact yeah. that ended up in locations that were in the required yard and that is a situation that we don't want to find ourselves in. Um, so I do know that staff worked very closely with this particular applicant and finding a transformer placement that worked both for the city code and for Excel's requirements. Um, this is the solution that we came up with, including the screening. It is correct that fencing is often not allowed. There are clearance requirements per Excel Energy's regulations. Um, there's a certain amount of clearance required around a transformer that typically prohibits fencing. So um, most commonly, we see this type of landscaping screening transformers. Thank you, Kimberly. Uh, OK. Um, is there anyone else uh, who has not spoken already uh, from the public who would like to speak on this item? If not, I'm going to close the public hearing. I already spoke. <laughs> no. No, nope, the public hearing, I'm going to close it right now. So the public hearing is closed. Um, commissioners, uh, Commissioner Rainville? So even if we open the public hearing, we don't let people speak more than once. <laughs> okay, Commissioner McGuire. All right, I'm gonna motion to approve item number five as staff recommended. Second. Thank you. All right, we have a motion and a second. Is there any additional discussion? All right, um, I'll just say, you know, this building, the only, app, the only application we're reviewing is site plan review. There's not any required parking. Um, they've met all of the requirements. Um, this is essentially something they can build by right. So um, I will be supporting um, the motion. All right, I'll ask the clerk to please call the roll. Commissioner Alper. Aye. Commissioner Baxley. Aye. Commissioner Campbell. Aye. Commissioner Feola. Aye. Commissioner Ford. Aye. Commissioner Marwa. Aye. Commissioner McGuire. Aye. Commissioner Rainville. Aye. Chair Olson. Aye. 
That's nine yeas and zero nays. All right, that motion passes. Our final item for the evening is item number six, 925 4th Street Southeast, and staff is Alex Kohas. Sorry, one moment. Thank you, President Olson, members of the commission. My name is Alex Kohlhaas, I'm a city planner with uh, CPAD. Before you today are land use applications for conversion of an existing building, which was most recently used as a hotel, into 43 dwelling units and two single room occupancy housing units. This is at the property at 925 4th Street Southeast. The property owner in this case is Hennepin County. They're also the applicants bringing forward these land use applications, which include a variance, to reduce the minimum gross floor area required per dwelling unit from 350 square feet to, in this case, a minimum of 302 square feet for efficiency dwelling units. And they're also uh, requesting site plan review, which, as you know, is uh, required for establishment of four or more new dwelling units or rooming units. And again, in this case, the proposal is uh, for a total of 45 new units, 43 of which would be dwelling units, two of which would be single room occupancies, uh, which are a type of rooming unit. On the left is the uh, zoning map for this area. The subject property is in the R5 multiple family district. It's also in the corridor six built form overlay and the university area overlay district. Uh, the lot area of the subject property is 30,665 square feet. You can see the, uh, the site plan on the right side of your screen. Uh, the existing building is uh, three floors. There's an existing parking area on the west side of the property, which is towards the top of your screen which has 40 existing parking spaces. These are the, uh, the floor plans in this case showing the lowest level, and the other two floors are substantially uh, identical to this one. Again, it's a total of 45 existing hotel units uh, across all three floors. Uh, 43 of those existing hotel units have in-unit kitchens, and uh, two of the existing units do not have in-unit kitchens. Again, the proposal is to convert all of the existing units into permanent housing, all of which would be affordable for households earning 30% of the area median income. A little bit of background on the zoning code uh, context for this proposal. Dwelling units and single room occupancy units are two distinct type of units uh, with different definitions in the zoning code. And the simplest distinction is this case, in this case is that dwelling units can have individual kitchens within the units. Rooming units cannot have kitchens within each unit. Uh, they may share uh, a, a shared kitchen space in another part of the building, um, but that's the, the important distinction in, in this case uh, for why the different types of units are being designated as such. Uh, single room occupancy housing units have no zoning code requirements for minimum floor area, so there's no variance that's required for establishment of the two single room occupancy units in this case. And again, the minimum floor area for uh, efficiency dwelling units at 350 square feet, so that is the variance that's being requested uh, in, in this case. There's some additional floor plans showing the other two levels, uh, which again are substantially identical to, uh, to the last slide. Uh, for the site plan review, um, there are minimal physical modifications that are being proposed to the property. For the interior, it's primarily uh, building code or other mechanical improvements that are being made, no real changes to, uh, to the unit layouts or demising walls or anything like that. Um, the exterior modifications are also very limited to some pedestrian improvements, some landscaping, uh, screening around the trash and recycling containers. Uh, the, the existing building is non-conforming with regard to several uh, of our current site plan review standards, but they're not proposing any uh, modifications that uh, would create new nonconformities or increase the existing nonconformities. No substantial alterations to the parking area are being proposed. No alternative compliance is being requested in this case. So staff recommendation is for approval of uh, the variance to, uh, to decrease the minimum floor area for the dwelling units and also for the site plan review. Uh, subject to some standard conditions of approval, you can see listed in your staff report, uh, plus a call out uh, 
a condition in particular that the applicant uh, add some additional screening on the west side of the parking area to bring that particular location into compliance with uh, site plan review standards for parking area screening. I'm happy to go into more detail about any of the findings if anyone on the commission is interested, um, but I'll conclude um, by saying the applicants, and I believe their representatives are in attendance during this hearing, uh, I'll also stand for questions. Thank you, Alex. Uh, Commissioner McGuire? Thank you. Um, can you explain to me why the two are being left as SROs? Or maybe that's a question for the applicant, but if you know. Yeah, Commissioner Olson, President Olson, Commissioner McGuire. Uh, my understanding is that it's because those two units don't have the existing kitchens, uh, that's why they're being designated as SRO units. I don't know if the applicant can speak as to why they're not proposing any other changes, but that's from staff's perspective, that's the distinction. Got it, thank you. Kimberly? Yes. Oh, I thought you were... That's up from before. Sorry. Oh, sorry. I thought, I thought I just heard you put that. Thank you, though. Anyways, uh, any other questions for staff? All right, I'm not seeing any. Thank you. Um, I'll open the public hearing, and would the applicant like to speak on this item at all? Briefly, if you would like. Chair Olson, Commissioners. I'm Julia Welly Ayers with Hennepin County, uh, Director of Housing Development and Finance. We're really excited to be here today talking about this project. This has been a long time coming. Um, as you know, we bought these buildings back in 2020 to provide protect protective housing for um, people experiencing homelessness at high risk of COVID-19. Luckily, we no longer need the buildings for that use, so we're excited to be talking with you and hearing uh, with the public about um, our plans to convert the project to housing affordable to people with incomes below 30% of the area median income. So I'll just be here for any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? Uh, looks like Commissioner Alper may have a question. Oh, you want to speak? <laughs> okay, um, we'll just continue with the public hearing. Okay, is there anyone else here who would like to speak on this item? You can come forward, state your name and address for the record and proceed with your comments. Good afternoon, commissioners and president. Thank you for the opportunity to be able to speak with you this afternoon. So my name is Paul Bernstein, and I'm, one of, I'm on the board of the nonprofit that is the property manager for Sigma Alpha Mu Fraternity, uh, the building and the grounds, which is the immediate adjacent neighbor to the Gopher Motel property that we're discussing this afternoon. Um, our fraternity has actually been, we're a social, we're a student organization, we're a social organization. We've been at the U of M campus for over 100 years. We've actually occupied the current residence at 928 Fifth Street Southeast next to the Gopher Motel for 45 years. Prior to when we owned the property, it actually was a sorority. All of the buildings, all of the residences across the street from or adjacent to this property are all student housing. In fact, they're all fraternities and sororities. I would offer that as the only immediate neighbor to this property, and I could see our building in the photographs over there, we have a property line that we share with them of almost 200 feet. We are the most impacted, uh, and we have a high level of relevance of our concern to this development, um, as in my opinion does would the neighborhood. So the east part of Marcy Holmes east of 35W, is comprised almost entirely of student housing. The Gopher Motel is right in the middle of the sororities and a group of fraternities that serve the U of M student body. Within a block of the motel, there are nine fraternities and sororities, each of whom have investments of probably between $5 million and $10 million in their properties. In fact, in the last five years, our nonprofit has put about a half million dollars of investment into our own property with a new roof, uh, foundation work, electrical, a whole bunch of other things. This proposed plan does not enhance these properties. It diminishes them. There's a bigger thing, frankly, to be discussed here, though, as well, too, which is all of the property owners in this neighborhood in East Marcy Homes recognize that this is a student neighborhood, and they market their properties as such. There are no, really no single family homes, owner occupied homes in this neighborhood. This is largely student housing. This is a neighborhood that is convenient to students to live in so they can walk the five blocks to 
the University of Minnesota's West Bank or East Bank campus. This proposed plan would change that. When property in our neighborhood starts being used for things unrelated to the university, whether for student housing or for staff housing, it limits the options for students at the university. Housing for students has to be located close to the university, while housing for non-students, as in this case, could really be located elsewhere. Bless you. In fact, about 20 years ago, the city of Minneapolis agreed with the Marcy Holmes Neighborhood Association that the city would not push to introduce more group homes in the neighborhood because there already were more group homes in Marcy Homes than any other neighborhood in the city. The late Doug Carlson was president of the Marcy Homes Neighborhood Association at the time. There are many areas in the city where this could go. Marcy Homes is not the right place for it. The property's use as a hotel or ideally as student housing would provide a service to the university-related communities served by this neighborhood, but not this. We strongly, we strongly oppose this proposed variance and site plan review. I'm happy to answer questions from any of, of you. Thank you for your comments. Commissioner Rainville? Thank you, Madam Chair. So does Hennepin County own this now? They do. They bought it, okay. And uh, the Marcy Holmes neighborhood, have they, uh, uh, and I'm sorry I was out in the hall earlier, you might have said this, but mm -hmm. have they uh, offered an opinion on this? Not That would be a question for staff. Okay, oh, I'm sorry. sorry. Yeah, okay. sorry. Um, thank you for your comments. Um, uh, Alex? <laughs> uh, President Wilson, Commissioner Rainville, uh, I was a staff member assigned to this. I have not received a formal response from the Marcy Holmes Neighborhood Association for this project. They would have received uh, public notices for this application like any other. Thank you. Uh, Hall, Commissioner Marwa, did you have a question? Uh, it was just for Hennepin, the Hennepin County folks to say what kind of outreach has been done to date with the neighborhood. Uh, Commissioner Solo, thank you for that question. Um, we sent the required notice in August um, for this, and then I did hear from Mr. Bernstein um, on a phone call, and we talked then. There was also outreach to uh, the county commissioner, Commissioner Conley, for the district. They had email communication, and then the Neighborhood Association reached out to me about a month ago, and we met together last Wednesday. So last Wednesday was our first conversation. Um, I, I believe it was not an official Neighborhood Association meeting, but there was outreach from the um, Neighborhood Council staff to invite people to the conversation. And um, you were there, Mr. Bernstein, maybe 10, 15 people were there. Um, the conversation there was both, both good comments from Mr. Bernstein as well as his neighbors, um, plenty of very positive comments as well as, of course, important comments from Mr. Bernstein. But as Alex noted, no official response yet as they have not had a time to vote. Thank you for that question. Uh, Commissioner Alper? Yes, I have a question for staff. I'm curious if there would be a variance required if there were no kitchenettes in the um, the dwelling, the 43 dwelling units. Thank you, President Olson, Commissioner Alper. There would be no variance required if, uh, if there were no kitchenettes in, in the units. They would still need the site plan review. Uh, but the variance is specifically because right. they would be dwelling units, and that's because right. they have the kitchenettes. And those kitchenettes are existing? Correct. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Rainville? Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I, I'm going to move that we postpone this one cycle so I can have a, a chance to talk to the Marcy Holmes neighborhood. And then I'm, I'm wondering, uh, have you talked to those sororities and fraternities? Have they are, are attempted to? Um, point of order before the motion. Can we finish the public hearing? I think there are other people that's that want to a talk. Good, that's a good point before a motion. So thank, thank you for yeah, yeah. reminding me. Uh, so I'll go forward with my question. And have you yeah. tried to reach out to the fraternities and sororities? Uh, Charleston, Commissioner um, uh, Rainville, thank you for that. Uh, we have not done that specific outreach waiting for this opportunity to come up. So we reached out to the Neighborhood Council, but not the specific sororities. Okay. 
And uh, just uh, a comment, are, yeah. are you aware of, of all the crime that's in plaguing that area? Okay, thank you. I've heard a few, I've received a few emails and responded to them in the last few weeks um, talking about that in specific. And uh, of course, this property would follow all the standard tenant landlord law and the city's requirements regarding rental licenses to be a good neighbor. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have a question for staff. Uh, what were the, I mean, public notices were sent to the neighbors, correct? I mean, correct. You're, you're asking about additional outreach beyond the, go ahead. I'm trying to be sensitive to all these young people who are in the most case pretty naive about urban living, especially in crime plagued areas. And I, I, I want to take the time to be sensitive to that and to make sure they're part of this process. Because okay. once uh, the county implements this, it's never going away. Okay. Got it. And, and Alex is saying that um, notices were sent to the neighbors, though, right? Okay. Got it. Just trying to understand. Um, all right. Is there anyone else who would like to speak on this item who has not already spoken? Um, state your name and address for the record and proceed with your comments. Thank you, commissioners, for the opportunity to speak to you. I am uh, supporting Paul Bernstein. I am an attorney and representative of the Sigma Alpha Mu fraternity as well. We actually own two properties adjacent to the Gopher Motel site. We would be most affected by the decision. Furthermore, when you looked at those schematics of those tiny little rooms, 300 square foot rooms, those are most appropriate for student housing. That is the best and highest use for this neighborhood that has historically served students. Bob Dylan, once known as Bobby Zimmerman, came down from the range and was a member of our fraternity where he received the inspiration for the song Positively 4th Street. This neighborhood is a vibrant, freewheeling student area we need to have congruent, sensitive use of this area so that it retains its character as a student neighborhood, close to the university, close to the University of West Bank. So I would encourage you to be sensitive in your governance and try to create a friendly amendment. Sure, we can have public housing, but can we have public housing that is geared towards students? Can the occupants of this property be enrolled at the University of Minnesota as a precondition to gaining uh, use of that property. Can this be a student housing building for the low-income students attending the University of Minnesota? Because we want to achieve not only diversity, but income diversity. And the greatest way to achieve income diversity is through education. Education is the great leveler and we believe that student housing is the appropriate use. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Is there anyone else who would like to speak on this item? Um, <laughs> you don't have to raise your hand. Um, you can come forward to the podium and state your name and address for the record. Yeah, hi, my name's Parnell Mahoney. I'm the pastor at Maranatha Church. We're within 350 feet of this, um, formerly the University Inn. Um, so, Right across the street, right across from 4th Street is a whole block of sororities. We're right in the middle of that block. Um, I don't think this is a good plan from the sound of it for our neighborhood. I really think this is gonna bring up crime. Um, we already have a problem with housing right now because of the increase in crime. And um, it's been increasing a lot. I think this is gonna increase it more. I think we need this to be student housing or something related to that or a hotel like it was. I mean, it, it's, in my opinion, from what I know, it's been safe enough as in the present use, the way it's been used for the last two years since Hennepin County bought it. Um, I think that the, I haven't heard about problems with um, looking at a friend over here who lives next door to us for indication, but I haven't heard about crime increase from the use of the property presently as COVID homeless, you know, shelter kind of thing whatever it's used for in that respect, if I didn't get that quite right. But um, I think um, the proposing to use it in, 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 uh, in the manner that uh, you guys propose to use it sounds like it's gonna increase crime. So I think we're gonna get rapes. So that's what I think. I think we're gonna, we're gonna have problems. We're gonna have crime. So I don't think it's a good idea. 
Thank you for your comment. Is there anyone else who would like to speak on this item before I close the public hearing? Take your okay, name. Can I ask a quick question? Yep. What is the current use of this? Has it been vacant for and for how long? I'm sorry, I was also out when you guys gave your presentation. Uh, no problem, Commissioner. Thank you for that question. The use since the county purchased it was as uh, essentially shelter, pandemic housing for people experiencing homelessness a deconcentration of shelter beds so that people weren't so close to each other on the floor. Um, so that it was a deconcentration. It was essentially shelter during that time. Um, and again, the new use will be rental housing, so people paying rent. So in many ways, it'll be much more stable. So I'm really grateful to hear that it's been um, low crime since the county has taken over. So it, it, the current use is um, shelter. It's now vacant while it's awaiting rehab. Um, and the new use will be permanent rental housing, not a group home, not public housing, and uh, not shelter. So. All right, is there anyone else who would like to speak on this item? State your name and address for the record. Hello, I'm Andrea Hamill Wallach. I'm principal architect at HW Square Design, um, hired by uh, Hennepin County. Um, <clears throat> thank you for your time. Uh, something that we forget as we're in the Midwest is that I, I lived in 274 square feet two years with one other person in a very small place. So these are 300 square foot units. They are for people that, ha as stated, have income that is 30% below the average. Um, so these are people working in restaurants and other low paying job that cannot afford all the other housing that is in the metro area or a home. Um, it might be people trying to get their feet back under them so they can get things, um, their life put together and move out of such small housing. Um, as stated, this is not public housing, this is not group home. These are people that are just looking for an affordable place to live. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak on this item who hasn't spoken already before I close the public hearing? State your name and address for the record, please. My name is Thomas Hurlbut. I am 410th Avenue Southeast. I'm representing Sigma Phi, Sigma Phi Epsilon. We are directly east of this property. My only comment is, uh, I received notice or was made aware of this uh, Friday. Uh, as the commissioner has mentioned, most of our residents are academically brilliant, but they're not very savvy when it comes to the ways of living in an urban environment. So I am more than convinced that your notice set on their mailbox uh, for the last 45, 60 days, whatever it was, um, which they finally forwarded to our uh, alumni board and made its way to me on Friday. So if we had more opportunity to discuss this and better understand the plans and vision that they are trying to, it would be better for all of us in the neighborhood. It is a student neighborhood, uh, in difference to the pastor. Uh, crime has increased steadily. I've been involved in this property for the last 12 years. And we're now buying cameras and searchlights. Okay. Uh, I mean, we're putting outside cameras up. Uh, we've had multiple cars broken into in the part in our parking lot. We've had the letters ripped off of our building multiple times. All right, could you? Okay. You've already anyway. spoken. Thank you. Thank you for your time this evening. If we could have more time to better understand the vision, uh, that would be better for the neighborhood. Thank you. Okay. You've already spoken. Is there anyone else who would like to speak? Please state your name and address for the record. My name is Marcine Crosby, and I live at 311 10th Avenue Southeast, and I'm the house director at Gamma Phi Beta Sorority. This is my fourth year. I'm an alum of the University of Minnesota, and I grew up on 42nd and Park in South Minneapolis. I am shocked at the crime in our neighborhood. My job, my first job, is to keep people safe, and it, I am ever vigilant. Uh, we have cars stolen, we have people come right up to our doors, we have packages stolen. I had someone break in, um, some person who had been living in the neighborhood, sleeping in a parking ramp, came in the kitchen, started cooking food, set the fire alarm off. She came into my bedroom while I was sleeping and took the laptop off my bed. I see her in the neighborhood because there's nowhere for her to go. I just would like to think that if people were in there that they are getting services that are helping them transition to the next point in their life, but we are overwhelmed with the crime in our neighborhood. And I don't say that lightly, and I'm gonna tell you, I'm not, I'm not afraid of anybody. 
<laughs> but I am afraid over there. So I just thought I would. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak on this item before we close the public hearing? All right, I'm not seeing any, so I am going to close the public hearing. Uh, I'm having the hardest time with names today. I can't believe I don't know what's going on. Go ahead. <laughs> I just I, I want to say that I appreciate the comments made by folks that have gathered here today. I also want to acknowledge that there's been, I think, a number of assumptions made about the residents who will eventually live in this building. Um, many of the assumptions are irrelevant to our ability to make decisions today. We are reviewing variance requests and site plans. Um, we're not passing judgment on who will live in homes and unfortunately what the situation uh, is with public safety around the neighborhood. So I just want to say, um, you know, I, I think there is a, a demonstrative uh, crisis when it comes to affordable housing in Minneapolis. And I think uh, we have to balance that need with the, the, the needs of the neighbors who live near it. But I do think that, um, you know, we have to keep in mind what we're here to discuss and decide today. And the situation in Marcy Holmes, um, whether it's crime or it's parking or whatever the case may be, is, is irrelevant to the decisions in front of this panel today. Thank you. Uh, McGuire? Thank you. Yeah, I would just like to echo what Commissioner Campbell said. Um, it is an existing building, so I would be supportive of the variance, which is under our purview, um, just for unit size. This would be an automatic um, approval. It would not need us if there were no kitchenettes. Um, to me, having kitchens in a space is much better for a resident than having no kitchens. So to deny it and then have them rip out the kitchens, but be approved just seems so counterintuitive because people need food and a place to cook safely. Um, so to me, the variance makes sense. Um, in terms of the site plan approval, we don't have much purview there. It appears to meet all of the requirements. Um, and in terms of just the, the safety issue, um, you know, we heard from the pastor, we heard from the fraternity that they're worried about safety. Um, I heard that you're really worried about rapes in the neighborhood. Um, well, I was raped by a fraternity brother. So I'm just gonna throw that out there that maybe you guys need to look at yourselves before you look at the affordable housing. Um, okay, well, okay. you've spoken, it's our turn now. Um, it really makes me upset. I don't, okay, stop talking. Um, <laughs> you guys need to look at yourselves first, stop turning. You know, if you are trying to be good neighbors, then you should open these people with welcome open arms. And how lovely is it that your affluent fraternity members get a chance to live next to someone that isn't like themselves. That's lovely. They're living in the exact same size housing units as these people that also deserve housing. Students are not a protected class. This, people that are non-students can live in this neighborhood. Um, I'm just going to say, I'll end there. I'm supporting this project. And honestly, you guys need to look at yourselves first. <laughs> Commissioner Rainville. So I move that we postpone this for uh, one cycle so I can have a chance to talk to the Marcy Homes and, and the broader neighborhood and the county and get us all in to uh, answer the questions, and especially about security. But just give me a little time. Uh, that's all I'm asking our commissioners, postpone it one cycle. Thank you. Um, is there a second before we hear anything? I'll, I'll second that. OK. Um, Commissioner Campbell? Uh, Commissioner Rainville, I just wonder, what would you learn in those conversations in the next cycle that would change the outcome today? I would learn about the security plan and I would give the neighbors a chance to, to interact with the county uh, for this use that will be uh, multi-generational and affect uh, the situation. Also, as an elected official, I, I get the calls, the emails, the texts about the crime in in Marcio. it's it's a very real issue i i hear that i hear that and i don't want to diminish the the role that you have in the community especially with this neighborhood i think that that's important i i don't foresee there being any outcome in further conversations with people surrounding the neighborhood that would change what we have in front of us today we aren't able to make findings related to public safety as it as it relates to variance and site plan reviews and so i think we're going to end up where we are right now, just two or three weeks down the line. 
and, and think so of I, how and think of how good you'll feel that the neighbors have had a chance to talk to the county and the pastor and the fraternities and give that extra layer of extra level of community involvement that hasn't happened. I well, and I would say that. I just want to make sure that we are setting good expectations for the process because this group is going to come back to us again after we continue this and the outcome is essentially going to be the same. I don't want to presume anybody else's votes, but we're, there, there's nothing within the purview of the planning commission that allows us to take into consideration the types of things that have been shared with us today. These are important things for people that live in our city, but they are not directly impactful to our ability to make a decision today. Uh, Commissioner Campbell, and I'm not asking you to do anything that we are not allowed to do. I'm just asking for some time to have some more community input and outreach. That's all I'm asking. All right, um, Commissioner Ford and then Commissioner Elber. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Uh, I, as, as it stands right now, I think this is a good project. I like it. However, uh, I. I've yet to see a situation where a discussion with a neighborhood was a bad idea. And um, I think that you know, the point of the public, uh, uh, process, public notice process is not to tick the boxes and, and check off the boxes and say we've done what's supposed to be done. It's supposed to have a meaningful conversation with the, with the neighborhood. And apparently that has not occurred. And I don't see anything that, uh, that bad will come, will, that can come from taking the time to talk to the neighborhood. If the result is that it comes back as it is right now, that's fine with me, but I think you, what you wanna do is provide a meaningful opportunity for the neighborhood to talk to the, the developer and, uh, and, and, uh, and give us their opinion. Um, uh, I understand what you're saying, but the, the issue is not uh, before us in terms of public safety and so forth. However, I don't see wh how it hurts to allow the community to have a conversation, a meaningful conversation uh, before our acting. Commissioner Alper. Thank you. I will not be supporting this motion to delay. I, I'm frankly um, amazed at the assertions in the audience. As an elected official, you know, we, um, you know, I get a lot of calls about crime. I do. And I get a lot of calls about housing. And I think, uh, a motion to delay is a motion to deny um, people what looks to be a wonderful place to live. And we have are in dire need of affordable and extremely low um, uh, income, um, uh, affordable homes that are really extremely affordable. And so, you know, I just want to share this because I, I feel it's important to know that 35% uh, of extremely low income renter households are in the labor force. They're working. You know, to hear you all, you'd think they're just um, committing carjackings. I, I think everybody should listen to themselves with, with what you're really saying about the people living in this project. And if um, it's really unfortunate to hear that, you know, 34% uh, are, are seniors. Um, 3% are in school, 21% are disabled, and this, these, are, these are Minnesota statistics. And I, you know, we, we need more affordable housing and we need it now, and to vote another two weeks to delay is just extremely unfortunate and I won't be supporting that. Commissioner Baxley. Um. I think just to be um, consistent with fellow commission, I think it is our expectation that we have neighborhood committees and uh, people applying for to meet all that. We that's a we vote on that all the time. So um, while I believe in this project, I think it's really important and echo my fellow commissioners' um, uh, sort of amazement at the things that have been said today. Um, I think I will be voting on an extension. Commissioner Marwa. Uh, yes, hi. I, you know, when I first read our packet with this information, I thought it was, um, you know, group home or SRO kind of in a traditional sense that, you know, shelter housing. And I think your explanation of that it is rental and it is income derived rentals and explaining 
how, you know, there's a number of people that service the campus, right? That could be living in this housing and could have jobs near the campus and explaining, I mean, I'm, if you're janitorial staff, you're commuting how far to get to work at campus. You could be living in this housing and paying rent and living near, you know, the sororities and fraternities that you work at also. And I think having the delay for me is to have that outreach with your community to explain that a little bit. And I think uh, Marcy Holmes writes us a letter in every single packet we have when there's a project, and the fact that we don't have a letter from them is why I'm thinking, um, I'm agreeing with my fellow commissioners about the delay, is that I just want you to make sure that there is a letter of support and that that piece is explained, because when I first read this again, I thought it was shelter housing um, as opposed to what it is. And I think also having, you know, University of Minnesota is a really progressive campus. Like explaining to the kids that you know you're living next to the staff that you're working with, and it's not you know homelessness in the same sense. I think that's um, a learning experience also that can be happened. So I'm I'm voting to delay for that reason. Kimberly, I just wanted to note a couple things. Um, if we if there is a motion that's approved to continue this for one cycle, that puts it on our November 14th agenda. Um, the applicant has indicated they did meet with Marcy Holmes. They weren't sure if it was an official neighborhood meeting or not. Marcy Holmes did have an official neighborhood meeting on October 25th. I don't know if that's the meeting you were at. It was the meeting you were at. Um, there is not another meeting for the Marcy Holmes neighborhood on the calendar. They have a TBD for November, but if we are not able to get that information before the November, 14th meeting, we do run into 6120 issues because we only have one meeting in December, um, and then everything after that ends up in front of city council if appealed at the beginning of the year in 2023. Um, so I just wanted to note that. Thank you, Kimberly. Um, Commissioner Rainbow. Thank you, Madam Chair. To be clear to my commissioners, I'm willing to put in the extra work uh, to uh, bring the Marcy Homes to the neighborhood. They have had a turnover in their board and in their leadership. Uh, I actually have a coffee schedule with the new president, Vic Thorson. So I'm, I'm willing to do the extra work to try and bring everybody together and uh, make this project work for everybody. Commissioner McGuire. I'm usually all in favor of going back to re-engage the neighborhood. This one is the only things under our purview are the variance for dwelling unit size and the variance for the minimum number of long-term bicycle parking spaces. As well oh, as that, what? Alex. Wrong one? Yeah, okay. There you go. Oh, whoops, wrong one. So, wait, minimum unit size and site plan review, yeah. and that's it. So, I don't want to just engage people for the sake of, in, of engagement. I want to go back and ask a real question that we can get real feedback on and have them come back with ideas if that's what we want to do. And in terms of the minimum unit size, I feel like, Again, they could come back neck, at the next meeting, remove all the kitchenettes, and we would have to approve it. So that's their option as well. If we wanted to table it to the next meeting, they could say, no, we're just gonna remove the kitchens, and now you have to approve it because it's approved by right. So, so to me, that sounds like we potentially are losing part of a good project by, by pushing for that. So if we do go back, I mean, what's I don't know what we're looking for from the neighborhood besides getting people riled up about affordable housing. It's an existing building and, it, and they're already operating there. Um, and typically I think you'd see more complaints from people about short-term housing versus long-term housing. So to me, it actually seems like, I, it feels like we're losing part of what we want to see by going back. Does that make sense? Because they could just remove the kitchens and be fine. We've already approved it like that. So this could be a day shelter if we deny, if we table this or push it forward, they could come back with a, a, a day shelter and it would be automatically approved under what they currently have. Right? Stop The public hearing is, is closed. The public hearing is closed. I, Commissioner Rainville. We didn't have a motion for that. The public hearing is closed. Please sit down. do my job as an elected official. You know, you, you're appointed, you have one level of responsibility. I'm elected, I have a higher level. Mm -hmm. And I just want to do that. I want to reach out to the county. I want to reach out to the neighborhood. I'm just asking for two weeks, that's all. 
All right. Um, so I agree with my commissioners who have said that there is no reason to delay. Nothing is going to change if we delay. I think especially Commissioner Campbell stated that very eloquently. I also want to express my frustration. I, it takes a lot, I think, to really upset me at a planning commission meeting like this. I've seen years of, of public testimony, um, but this was really upsetting. Um, I, I'll say that, you know, when I, my first job out of college, I lived in a market rate 300 square foot apartment in Loring Park. Um, that was $625 a month. And I was working as a government employee. Like, this is what this type of housing is for. Or someone who works at a restaurant, like we said, or maybe a teacher. Um, so I fully support this project, um, and I will, be, I will not be supporting any delay. Excuse me. All right. Is there any other discussion? Otherwise, the motion on the table is to delay. All right. Um, seeing none, I'll ask the clerk to please call the roll. Commissioner Alper. No. Commissioner Baxley. Yes. Commissioner Campbell. No. Commissioner Fayola. Aye. Commissioner Ford. Aye. Commissioner Marwa. Aye. Commissioner McGuire. No. Commissioner Rainville. Aye. Chair Olson. No. That's five yeas and four nays. All right, that motion passes. Um, our, that was our final item for this evening. Are there any announcements from staff? No updates at this time, thank you. All right, anything else before we adjourn? All right, with not and without objection, I will declare this meeting adjourned. Our next planning commission meeting will be Monday, November 14th, and our next committee of the whole meeting will be Thursday, November 3rd.